Okay, and we're off. Welcome everyone. It's a beautiful day out today. Nice May temperatures. Um, as usual, we're gonna have an introduction here then we'll have our Stroud updates. We're gonna have part two of water temperature talking about monitoring and data usage at the local level. I'll be doing that presentation and then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion. Meeting is being recorded. Recordings are always at this location. Meetings are every third Thursday of the month, always at 2.30. It's always the same Zoom link. Keep that for your records if you like. Um, I send out reminder emails. If you would like to add anyone to those emails, um, please let me know. I'll put them on the distribution list. Just as a reminder, the attendees for these meetings are um, often working in the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. Some folks not in the DRWI, but in the Delaware Basin. And then we have some folks from outside the DRB. Stroud is able to offer um, these meetings uh, and other support via the DRWI and via the Consortium for Scientific Assistance to Watersheds from PADEP. Um, here's the, the um, DRWI webpage, Four States, One Source. Feel free to check it out. Uh, Seesaw, there's the website for that. That allows the Stroud Center to provide support to watershed groups in the uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, so goals of these meetings, just uh, time every month for us to present information, talk about issues, provide updates. Um, we have a presentation most times and um, we're always just thinking about gathering good data and using it purposefully. There's me, Rachel Johnson, Krista Reeves, and Shannon Hicks, all sort of the team, Stroud Center team on this. Krista is a part-time Stroud person, is a um, one of the major employees at the Muskinet Kong Watershed Association leading monitoring efforts there. Um, and then two master watershed stewards, among others, that are um, involved in this network, Carol Armstrong and George Seeds. Um, Leaders of the overall DRWI effort, John Jackson, Matt Earhart, and Dave R. Scott at the Stroud Center. Um, our primary goal from the Stroud perspective uh, with the Enviro DIY st stations and monitoring in general is to support groups in doing what they want to do um, in terms of science and monitoring. And secondarily, we are uh, doing analyses, providing support infrastructure, um, to support those groups. Um, so moving on to updates from the Stroud Center. Just a reminder that there are lots of different guidance materials at this site, wikiwatershed.org slash DRWI. Um, you can go to just the Wiki Watershed page and click this link right here to get there as well. Um, there's, there's shortcuts that you can use to get to the all of the different sections. Um, just a few updates here about the data entry. There's a new uh, data entry tab here to make it a little clearer when you're entering your field visit data from visiting your stations. Um, and um, basically just this slide is to just encourage, to remind me to encourage everyone to when you go to a station to fill out a form, you can fill out a hard, hard form, which you'll also find on this site and then enter the data, enter the information into this online form, which is also here. Um, right, right here. And then also wanting to point out that there is a new service request tab here, where you can use that to, um, if you're having problems with a with a Enviro DIY station, you can fill this out. It is simpler than the previous version we had. Um, <clears throat> there's only a few required fields. There's other fields you can fill in if you want to provide more information. But um, anyone with assistance needs, we we would like you to fill this out, um, just so that we can have a, a formatted 
kind of formal way to keep track of, of stations that are needing assistance. Okay. Um, our conversations and work still uh, um, is uh, around uh, the, doing these snapshots, the synoptic sampling um, uh, on salt and on water temperature coming up here, hopefully. So um, if you would like to do any of that type of work, please feel free to be in touch and we can assist with that. We have protocols and guidance on that and can assist directly. Also um, a request, if, um, if you want, if you're interested, feel free to share photos from the field, stories about what you're doing, successes, learning experiences, whatever. If you'd like to share them, um, we're happy to um, put them out on social media and such. Diane is the one that does that, so you can feel free to contact her directly um, and or you can send to me. Okay. Um, Tally MacArthur, who has been attending these meetings, I don't think she was able to be here today. She's also part of the local policy and practice group now. She hosted this conversation cafe titled Putting Water Quality Data to Work Locally. She did this yesterday and it went well. There is a recording available. So um, it's not gonna be posted, but you can contact Tally if you would like a recording of that. And there's her email. Um, just wanted to note here, uh, our upcoming meetings, we have Krista for June 15th, um, July 20th, we are scheduled to have updates from the policy uh, practice work group. So um, Dave Manning, Steve Tricarico, Ian Brastow, and others in that group, we can certainly um, be thinking about our, our work in the next couple months with regard to having some, you know, more kind of official deliverables at this meeting that we can present to the group and maybe even provide to the group as materials that they can use. Um, August 17th, we need a volunteer. Um, possibly it is summer, getting towards the end of summer or the latter half of the summer, I guess, latter third maybe. Um, <clears throat> so maybe water temperature as a subject, but um, we're looking for a volunteer uh, person or group to um, present, to, to, to do a presentation that meeting. So please consider whether you would like to do that. And then we've got um, visiting the salt topic in September and October. And then we need another volunteer in November. Okay, so think about that. I don't even have a suggested topic there. So um, if anyone is interested in presenting in November, please feel free to be in touch. And then one other thing, uh, December um, meeting is currently scheduled, just third Thursday of the month falls on December 21st. That's getting really close to the holidays and such. So my suggestion is to move it to December 14th. So unless there's any problems with that, I think we'll just move it to um, December 14th. Okay, uh, so I will pass it off to, I guess, maybe Dave, I guess maybe Dave is going to do the updates. Is that right, Dave? Yeah, if it's okay with Ian. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. I wasn't, I wasn't at the last meeting, so I think you would be <laughs> best yeah, to okay. take the list. <laughs> All right, so I'll take it from there. Um, if you would go ahead, uh, David, and flip the slides for me, great. Um, so this is from our agenda at our last meeting. This is uh, May 3rd. It was our fourth meeting of the uh, work group. These are the items of interest for us. Um, David already talked about our first item, which was a discussion of the conversation cafe that was put together by uh, Tally, which is fantastic. I, some of us attended that last night. I recognize some of you. Um, we spent a lot of time in our last meeting discussing the types and the forms of resource documents or deliverables uh, to all of you uh, that we wanted to uh, emerge uh, from our work over the next year or so. And so I'm gonna discuss that at some, some length, relative length uh, today. 
Um, we also wanted to welcome a new member of our uh, work group, and that's uh, Steve Tricarico, who's here today as well. Uh, Steve is a master watershed uh, steward uh, that works up in Berks County. Um, he is a member of a township planning committee there, uh, and his background is in engineering. So there's a lot of expertise that we can tap uh, in terms of uh, our work group. And Steve has already uh, come to bat on a number of occasions for us with um, new perspectives, and that's what we enjoy. Uh, next slide, please, David. Um, so our uh, current membership um, runs to the number of nine. Uh, we meet uh, first Thursdays of each month at 11 o'clock by Zoom. Um, if anyone is at all interested in joining up with us, please talk to Dave Bressler. Uh, we could use, we're entering into a phase of a little bit more work and the work is varied and we need lots of perspectives uh, to keep us going in the right directions. Um, and uh, so please, if you are interested, uh, let David know, and then we can go from there. Okay, the next slide. Uh, just as a reminder, um, the charge to our work group uh, was defined uh, several weeks ago, so maybe two months ago, uh, and that is to develop the most effective ways of employing stream monitor data to advise and otherwise influence municipal entities. And implicit into this charge is um, an emphasis on uh, stream water quality in relation to uh, land use and development. So we look at this from a current perspective and we also look at it from uh, a prospective point of view, what's coming down the line and how do we adjust and uh, begin to interact with municipalities uh, with regard to that adjustment. If I could have the next slide. So in terms of the types and forms of resource documents that we wanted to come out of the committee, uh, we are angling at the present, and this is not fixed rigidly in any sense, we're angling for um, probably a total of five documents four documents that focus on the fundamentals of stream monitoring data and their relation to land use and development. And these would deal with uh, temperature, depth, conductivity, and a, a lesser priority, uh, turbidity. And the example I'm gonna use for you uh, will be a document uh, that relates to temperature, at least a schematization of a document that relates to temperature. And then one document, our fifth document that would provide guidance in identifying and um, interacting with uh, appropriate uh, municipal decision makers. So we're going to talk about um, the first of the four documents, temperature, and we could go to that slide. That'd be great. Okay, um, so this is uh, our idea of what a resource document for a stream monitoring data might look like, uh, and the specific data would be temperature. Um, it would consist of a series of sections, and we talk about this all the time, so it's very fluid <laughs> as, as to what will, will come out and what will be the exact nature of these, these documents, but there's a certain flow and logic to it, and I'd like to go through that. So again, this is for, this, for stream temperature. Um, the first uh, uh, section of such a document would be a, dollar, a, a, um, a discussion of determinants of stream temperature. This is natural and anthropogenic, and this is very much along the lines of what uh, John Jackson provided to us last month. Uh, segue into temperature thresholds for aquatic organism, organisms, um, fish, and uh, benthic macroinvertebrates at a minimum, and, and especially focusing on those uh, within the Delaware River Basin. Um, and then uh, a section on uh, land use or development that might be of concern uh, with respect to stream temperature um, specifically, or uh, together with some of the other data uh, regarding stream health. Then uh, a section on factors that might motivate municipalities to modify land use or development related to impacts on stream temperature. And then we would end with something like uh, case studies. 
So the logic in all this, the first two bullet points represent a knowledge base for uh, the likes of you, the likes of me, uh, in the uh, the environmental DIY monitoring um, scheme. Uh, so that's the knowledge base. And, and then we come up, the third section, the third bullet point is uh, where we begin to be concerned about something as it relates to at least temperature, but again, to other things uh, possibly. Uh, and then the fourth is how we begin to interact uh, with decision makers within municipalities. And that's informed a little bit by case studies. And the case studies can be real, drawn from real anecdotes, or they can be contrived depending upon how we want to uh, work this kind of thing. I would also say that in terms of factors that mo motivate municipalities, um, some of the section might be it would be devoted to you uh, and how you're going to interact with the decision makers. But another major part of the section, and maybe a split out, would be um, the kinds of information sheets that you might provide to those with whom you interact with in these municipalities that are gauged to their knowledge base. Uh, so we obviously would want, have, would want to have something that we could communicate with easily and um in in terms of effectively with uh with the municipal entities so uh this is something that we're discussing we just had a discussion prior to this meeting about what what kinds of information do we want to have not only for us but information that we would want to have in interpretable readily visualized uh ways for uh, municipal decision makers okay and the next slide and my last slide, and it's a busy slide, and it certainly does it. This represents what we discussed in our meeting, but uh, it's open to lots more than this and further discussion for sure. So this would be our fifth document. Um, and this is the one that would provide guidance in identifying and talking to appropriate uh, municipal decision uh, makers. Uh, the first is obvious. We want to identify who these decision makers are. Uh, the hierarchies within which they work with re with regard to these uh, decisions and the knowledge that they might want to have because anything that we present to them should be keyed uh, to their knowledge base so that they can interpret and make decisions appropriately. Uh, we want to identify, of course, what decision makers care about, and this is going to depend so much on the township that we're dealing with. So this is going to be a lot of work for us to identify the range of townships and, and uh, what can inform uh, uh, decisions and the way we present data. Uh, obviously, local economy is, is important. Uh, community sentiment is hugely important. Remembering that um, decision makers, whether they're elected or not, emerge from the community. So the sense, you know, what the community has as a uh, as a sense of itself is important, the sense of its vitality, the sense of what's important to it, the sense of any concurrence with um, ecological environmental factors, those need to be identified uh, for each community. Again, it's going to depend a lot on the um, on the township. And of course, compliance with county, state, and federal mandates. Uh, this document would also um, include points that relate to establishing a sense of collaboration. We strongly feel that a collaborative approach is important as opposed to an adversarial approach. There is a time and a place for an adversarial approach, but collaboration is key. And uh, points under this, and I'll end with, with these points, is um, for uh, participation in meetings or on advisory committees, sharing model ordinances and mutually beneficial grant opportunities, shouldering some of the workload. I think all, we all do this anyway, uh, which would be, for example, um, best management practices with respect to MS4 requirements, for example, rain gardens or um, erosion controls and, and so forth. That's, that's, that's a collaborative thing that we can do with these communities and it's recognized. And, Finally, being there, and this harks back to um, the previous sets of documents, being there in an identifiable fashion as a knowledgeable and a trusty resource. 
So that's what came out of the meeting. And uh, we have much more work to do. And uh, obviously, we're presenting it here today for any input that you might have now or, or later. Wonderful. Thanks, Dave. Um, any questions before we move on in general or for Dave? Um, I think it was very comprehensive, uh, terrific. And it, it just got me thinking about uh, some practical um, approaches and uh, when you're developing approaches, doing um, role playing. In other words, somebody playing the local person who says, what's a degree here to up or down a couple of degrees? What does that matter? Somebody who's resistant or, or somebody who's just uh, skeptical. And I think that really helps. That's that's great. That's a, a great idea. Thank you. Um, so and Bert is asking, Bert, who is also up there in New York where Grace is, Bert is saying, have you had any opportunity to share data gathered with your municipality representatives? Uh, I'm not, I guess, is that I guess maybe that's for you, Dave? Question for Dave Manning. Um Yes, on the work group, we have, of course, we have Steve, who is a, a, a member, is a decision maker within a municipality. Um, we have someone who is striving to be such a, an individual, so is uh, immediately in tune with uh, a, a lot of the perspectives offered from uh, these decision makers. Um, we haven't presented what we're putting together to um, in, in any kind of a comprehensive way uh, to uh, municipal officials, but that's not, that's actually a pretty good idea as, as we begin to generate more formal documents. It would be nice to pass these by um, uh, those who are looking at, at the situation from the other side. That, that, that's a very good suggestion. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I had some experience, but go ahead. There was. Um, you, want me to, you want me to go ahead, or? Um, uh, well, I wanted to share also with Bert. We had um, uh, our group spoke at a public hearing um, for a very big project in Huguenot, uh, New York, an expansion of a, a facility. Um, and it's right on the never sink. And um, we had our experts come and challenge uh, the engineering work as rather incomplete and some of it uh, inaccurate. So we all, we had a public uh, comment period. So we had about, oh, there are 25 people spoke uh, questioning it and, uh, um, half of the, oh, oh, I should say, uh, maybe nine were endorsing it with, with no questions asked. And so my point was um, the Never Sink has issues um, such as some questionable levels of cadmium. And then I went on to state that uh, Chloride is becoming a problem in many areas uh, and just alerting them to the potential of, of water issues within our protected um, Never Sink River and that you're not supposed to get more than four fish uh, trout from uh, the Never Sink a month. Uh, eat no more than four. Um, this is the native. Uh, it's not the um, the ones that were introduced April 1st. Um, so it gave them a sense 
that there are specifics and we shall see, um, but it was an opportunity uh, uh, to, to, to get some stuff out there for them to pay attention to. Yeah, and Grace, maybe at some point we'll ask for your feedback on some of these documents that we're gonna be preparing. Um, Steve Tricarico, were you chime, trying to chime in? I, I think uh, Grace did a good job there talking about the potential. Uh, I've presented to uh, our board of supervisors, not in my role as a planning commissioner, but in my role as a member of Tuppahalton Creek Water Association, where they had zoning hearing boards where some developers wanted to get variance from having to meet our riparian buffer requirements. And fortunately, not only myself, but also our engineer was strongly opposed to granting the waivers. So they were given some uh, conditional waivers, but it was uh, marginal compared to what they originally wanted. And again, you know, the importance of, I think most people in this meeting here know the importance of having riparian buffer zones around water streams. That's great. Just that type of little example, little case study would be, I think would be nice little anecdotes to have in a, in a broader document. Those firsthand experience type situations, I think, can be really useful to communicate. Um, all right, so I, in the interest of time, I'm going to share and continue with the presentation and hopefully I can get through this with enough, enough time that we can return to the, to the discussion, which I will end on this same topic. Okay, so this is the second part of, te of temperature monitor of the temperature topic monitoring and data usage. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, monitoring with continuous data using Enviro DIY stations, monitoring with continuous data using other products like the Hobo Tidbits is the example I'm going to use here, and then synoptic sampling or uh, snapshots as we've been calling them. Uh, and then I'm going to follow that up with, like I mentioned, um, you know, this idea of using the temperature data at the local level, and I'll kind of bring in some of the discussion that um, Dave Manning and Steve uh, have been having. So um, three potential sources of uh, water temperature data I'm going to talk about here, we, as I just mentioned, the Enviro DIY stations are continuous, they're online, and they're real time. They're temporarily detailed, but they're spatially limited, right? You just, you know, they're, they're fairly expensive, so you can't necessarily put these all over your watershed. You get a lot of data from one spot, but you don't get a lot of information from around the watershed. Um, <clears throat> Hobo tidbits, which are temperature loggers, they collect continuous data. Um, they are not online out of the box, but if you reconfigure the uh, files, uh, you can upload those to monitor my watershed so that you can put them online. And um, they are not, but that is not real time. So again, they are temporarily detailed, a lot of information at one spot, continuous data. Um, but again, they're spatially limited. Um, they're, they're cheaper though, you know, they're, they're, substantially cheaper than the than the Enviro DIY station. So you're less spatially limited with these. You can pop a, a number of these around a watershed and not feel like you're you know spending thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, and then the synoptic sampling, um, handheld meters, handheld thermometers, um, they're not online obviously, but you do get a lot of spatial detail because it's a cheap, um, it's a cheap product that is the thermometer itself. And um, with people power, you can get to a lot of uh, locations within a watershed in a short period of time. So you're temporarily limited, but can you can really get a lot of spatial detail and for a low cost, as long as you have people. So here's the uh, Enviro DIY stations. Everyone knows what these look like. This is the new CTD sensor. Um, <clears throat> so as we know, the continuous data can show patterns throughout the year. So you have your, you know, year after year, you can have your, you can see your spring data, 
you can see the temperatures increasing. You can see summer sort of peaking out towards the end of July and early August and coming down into fall, kind of mirroring spring and then going into winter. And if you keep your stations functioning, if you pay attention to the data, if you keep them online, you keep the sensors um, functioning, checking the data to make sure you can replace a sensor when needed, you can have a really good picture of um, what your temperature or other parameters look like um, day to day and throughout the year. So day to day, this is an example of um, just a shorter period of time, a number of days in, um, <clears throat> in the summer. And when you have this daily information, you can start to look at things like I'm um, illustrating here, which is temperature as it relates to trout. So, you know, you have a really good idea with this continuous data where a stream sits with regard to its ability to support trout. So here we are at 24 degrees Celsius, which is sort of your upper limit, or you know, when you're if you're if you're especially if you're headed beyond that and getting even higher than that, um, that you're you're entering that potentially lethal zone for trout. This middle ground between 20 and 23 and a half, 24, um, is that region where you know your trout are going to be stressed. It's not super, super catastrophic, but they're going to be stressed. And then down here, you're really in your sustaining temperatures below 20 degrees. Ideal is down around 16, which we don't even see on this graph. But once you get below 20, you can kind of breathe, breathe a little easier. But when you're getting up here in the low 70s Fahrenheit and beyond, that's where the trout are really going to be getting stressed. So your daily temperature data, you know, obviously you can see like this, you have major variations here. And that's why I chose this graph. You can see major variations in this stream. And this is going to be primarily dependent on air temperatures. Um, another thing that the continuous data can show you with regard to temperature um, is um, some of these not, I don't want to say unique, but 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 less common situations in which you have runoff during storms, uh, summer storms, and you're getting these big flushes of warm water um, from hot asphalt or from you know water in stormwater ponds, warmed up water from stormwater ponds that flows out during storms. And what you get is these types of, see, you have a depth increase and then you have a major increase in temperature. And you can see here, temperature is going from about 18 all the way up to 24 in a very short period of time. Trout don't adapt super quickly to temperature changes. So that can be a problem. Here's a uh, graph of temperature spikes in Valley Creek. And you can see, again, multiple spikes here happening through the summer in which temperature is going, again, from about 18 all the way up to 24 and even above 24 here. This is at one station. This is another station. And you can see these are artifacts. These aren't real here. You can see one even gets above 25. Um, so. You know, and there's a big difference if a, if a stream gradually gets to 24 versus getting to 24 in a couple hours or less, the trout are going to respond much differently. So um, there's a lot of text here, but so I'll just go through this. Quick increases in water temperature cause surges of stress hormones in trout. Worse effects on adult and larger trout. So you can imagine that affecting uh, reproduction as well. Experimental temperature increase range in this paper was from 13 to 25 degrees. That's a wider range than we actually saw at Valley Creek, which as I pointed out, was it going from about 17 to 25. However, the rate of increase was actually quicker in Valley Creek about 5.3 degrees per hour as opposed to three degrees per hour in the experiment. So Valley Creek was shooting up in temperature five degrees 
per hour. Um, this isn't definite, but it does suggest that the trout populations of Valley Creek may be affected by this. Um, and um, there are there are uh, a lot of small fish in Valley Creek, so it's something that um, is worth worth considering when we think about temperature data, especially um, in semi-urban and urban areas that have stormwater ponds and have a lot of asphalt that flush warm water into the streams. Hey, hey, Dave, what yeah. what about the the length that it remains warm? It looks like valleys, you know, it's going up very quickly, very high, but it's dropping just as quickly. Yep. Yep. So yeah, it's not staying in there because it's just a pulse. It's just a yeah. pulse of water that just comes in and then goes out. So, you know, I think it's mostly, Steve, it's just, I mean, presumably if it stayed high, it would be even worse. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it's almost, it's almost as if you want to analyze it by area under the curve. Some kind of integration approach. Yeah, except except there is this there's also the steepness of the curve. Because it's about the, as at least from that, what that paper is saying, it's, you know, it, if you have, if, if it's gradual, the trout may be able to physiologically adjust better than if it's super steep. That is a super steep increase yeah. where it, you know, it, it is much more stressful. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dave, that's Mike Bullard. Hey, Mike. Hey, I would love to see a, a mayfly with two sensors on it, one down in, like a, a backwater pool uh, during these events to see, yeah, obviously that the most of the creek's going to get pretty hot, but it'd be neat to see what's the places where the trout would tend to hold anyway, not that I know much about trout, to see how those stratified pools towards the bottom of the creek might uh, react yeah. during these events. Yeah, and that's the type of temperature monitoring that these that these super trout research guys do like Keith Fritchie, who was with TU, he's back in back in in the Northeast in New England again, but he was doing work on the Lapat Kong um, and was putting these, you know, little loggers all over and and looking at springs coming in to warm up water in the winter and with regard to, you know, supporting trout reproduction and trout, trout um par and stuff. So um, yeah, it's it's a good question, Mike, because there oh, be, a lot of this temperature stuff really does depend on well, are there refuges for the trout whenever the water gets warm? Can they go it, upstream into a cooler stream? Can they find a cooler area within the stream that they're in? Mayfly is perfect for putting two or three or four temperature sensors in pretty much in the same area, but in different places. The creek. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So one thing I just wanted to mention before I move on, the importance of doing these um, cross checks, you know, just doing a temperature reading. Here we're talking about temperature. So doing a temperature reading with a handheld meter and putting it against the, um, the sensor reading from the station. This just helps, you know, can, helps us continue to, um, you know, confirm that the data are accurate with your individual station. It certainly just gives um, an individual user confidence in their data. So just encourage everyone to do quality control cross checks regularly, quarterly, and then if, when you see wacky data, bop out there and do a cross check and make sure that you're reading real and not fouled or broken. Um, okay, so just a few more slides on this. So again, more costly with the with these uh, Enviro DIY stations. Um, just some features, data transmission directly to the online portal in near, near, real time, near real time. You have to pay the cell bill as well. Semi-permanent installation, um, you know, and the station needs to be tended to. These are the most high maintenance of the, of the things I'm gonna mention today. You've got all these wires, you've got exposure to vandalism, um, they're on land. They're not sunken in the water, obviously. Um, so they're, you know, they're vulnerable in a number of different ways. So you need to pay attention to the data. You need to pay attention to what the things look like out in the field. Um, so there is, there is, they are a higher maintenance 
thing, but they give you the most sort of robust data set in that it's real time, it's on it's online and it's continuous. Um, all of this building installation maintenance, all or more time, but you know, as I just said, it gives you the ability to have real time data that's different than these hobo tidbit loggers that I'm going to mention now, which are much cheaper though, you know, and they're about the size of a silver dollar or something, whatever, like half a silver dollar. If anyone even remembers what those looked like. Um, 69 bucks for one of those. You can set the timing to whatever you want. Um, you want to shield the logger from direct sunlight. You know, you can cover it with rocks. You can put it along a bank, whatever. It's inexpensive installation. You can get this sort of holster that it comes, that they make to, to go with it. Um, you do need to download the data relatively uh, frequently. You want to kind of want to make sure that it's, that it's, your sensor is still there and it doesn't hold infinite amounts of of data like the like the mayfly logger does these will these will top out and it depends on how frequently you're collecting the data um, <clears throat> once you download it you can have it in spreadsheet format and as i mentioned you can transform the column headers using the uuids that you associate with monitor my watershed and then you can upload the the data to monitor my watershed and then you can can use all the features that are in there and monitor. Here's a couple ways you can attach these hobo loggers to different um, uh, products in the streams. You can use a uh, attach it to a rebar, which you could drive into the stream. You can attach it to a PVC pipe. A lot of people seem to like to attach them to like bricks. I have a few pictures of that. This is the setup that. Um, Al Renzi with the Valley Forge Trout Unlimited use. So he had it on a, a coupler, which he inserted on top of this rebar, which was then driven into the stream. Um, this is a logger that was done in uh, Darby Creek by Darren LeBreak. So he just drilled the, the screws right into a brick. Here they've strapped the loggers with zip ties into a brick with holes. Um, this is a something used by the EPA. This this not only secure it, so it's it's inside of a plastic kind of compartment here, which is then attached to rebar. This compartment um, not only is set up to allow you to attach it to this, but it also protects it from direct sunlight. And then getting into the synoptic sampling, um, the idea here it's low cost. You know you've got your very low cost items that are just thermometers, 10, 11 bucks for these. This is your standard sort of reading it um, on the scale here, uh, thermometer, and then you can have digital thermometers. Lots of people have these, you know, conductivity temperature meters, but they are a little more expensive. So if you're gonna be working with a group of a dozen or 20 or 30 people to do a, a temperature snapshot, these may not be doable. If you're working with a group of five or six or seven, then maybe everyone has these for other purposes and everyone can just go out with them. Um, so with the synoptic sampling, um, you use lots of people or at least a number of people and that's how you get the work done. Um, so, you know, I don't wanna get too much into the details, but you, you do wanna be, you want to consider how people are going to be using these and if you can actually read, make sure to read the gradations in a thermometer like this. Um, so just speaking to the idea that you want to be, you know, cognizant of what your group of people needs in order to, to effectively function out there. Um, <clears throat> so what I have here is kind of sort of an example setup of just doing a detailed temperature monitoring effort in which you have a Enviro DIY station somewhere in the watershed. Here I have it at the furthest downstream end, which is not necessary. You could have it wherever, um, but regardless, it's one it's one location in which you have uh, access to real time information, what's going on right now at the stream. Then conceptually, you could put additional uh, continuous loggers 
up in, in different watersheds. You know, here I have, I put one in, in on here in this sub watershed, one in this sub watershed sort of draining some more residential type uses. And then in this watershed draining a mostly a forested watershed. Uh, so that gives you more continuous data from out in the watershed. And then doing your going and doing your synoptic sampling, sampling during one hot day and fanning out with a group of people and going to all these yellow dots and getting a snapshot, a picture of what temperature looks like throughout the watershed, ideally, you know, during the hot time of a day. So you're getting that top level of what temperature looks like. Okay, um, so uh, more on the snapshot. We have this uh, detailed protocol. It's very structured, very similar to the SALT protocol that we have that some of you have used. Um, so we're just kind of finalizing that with some details. Um, so what am I doing here? I think I have this, this is not quite in order. All right, so this is the same, I already described conceptually this, this stuff here. So I'm just gonna skip through because we are running out of time here. Um, <clears throat> so basically the idea here is to just, as you sh as I showed in that previous map, you're positioning sites in advance, you're knowing where you're going in advance and you're fanning out across a watershed such as this to, to get sites in a lot of different, as many tributaries as possible, uh, draining from as many unique different spots of the landscape as possible so you can get a picture of conditions throughout the watershed. Um, idea being, you're gonna try to get the maximum temperature time and across the Delaware Basin, the average maximum temperature occurs approximately at 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, <clears throat> so the idea here is to show where cool refuges are, where warm problem areas are and possible reasons for those situations. Um, so this is a graph of average time of summer day when maximum water temperature occurs. So maximum water temperature, you can see here, it's at over 100 stations, 120 stations throughout the Delaware Basin is occurring mostly between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. And the average among these was, was 3.30. Um, <clears throat> so if you take that as, as the average, um, here we're saying, and you can also, also do this, if you have a continuous station, you can certainly do it according to what your continuous station is telling you is when your maximum is happening. So the idea here is to find whatever time where your maximum temperature is happening and go from that to determine your window in which you do the synoptic sampling. So here, if you go four hours, you would go from 2.30 in the afternoon to 6.40 in the afternoon as your window to sample. And, you, and that takes you to a half a degree difference from the peak. So here we're at 25.7. Um, you go two hours this way, you go two hours this way, and you've got four hours in which you can get in, get within a half degree of this maximum temperature. If you allow yourself to get within one degree of the maximum temperature, you, you have seven hours. I think this is more the ideal Get, get as close as possible to the maximum temperature. Um, so you need, the idea is you need to choose a sort of a normal summer day or a hot day. You don't wanna choose a cool day because you can see here, there's a big difference between when you do, you know, water temperatures on a cool day and a hot day. So you're gonna wanna look at air temperature and you're gonna wanna know what historic air temperature is and know what your current temperature is predicted to be. Um, so snapshots, even if you do happen to go out on a cooler than normal day, you're still always gonna be able to compare uh, between your sites. So you're getting a whole bunch of sites, you're, all out, you're doing them all on the same day, so you're always gonna be able to compare among those. But it's not really gonna, if you're not on, out on a hot day, you're not gonna really be able to tell what that means as far as like, um, really what, for instance, trout may be facing on a hot summer day, what the conditions may be like then. Um, <clears throat> so 
And in those cases, you're not really going to be able to compare to trout thresholds, and you're, it's going to be difficult to compare to other watersheds um, if others are doing, you know, these snapshots on warm days. So really, the idea is to do it on a normal or hot, warm summer day, not not some cool day. Um, so here's a data sheet. You know, mark air temperature for that day, and then sites, locations, date, time water temperature. Um, so to ensure you're getting data that represent the most temperature stress conditions, sample on days when it is at least average air temperature for that time of year in that location. Okay, Use your online historical data to determine what the past averages have been. Use local, online, and current predicted data to plan for, for the snapshot event. So you know, you should have rain days scheduled, so-called rain days <laughs> scheduled. You should have alternate days scheduled so that if when your sample day comes around and your air temperature is hot, then you can proceed. But if your air temperature is not what it needs to be, if it's lower than normal, then ideally you're going to reschedule the event for a day when you're working with warmer conditions. Um, so once you get the data, these are summer water temperature thresholds for trout. Um, and actually I should have had this slide before that. Um, so this is a relationship of um, average temperature versus maximum temperature, okay? So when you're going out and doing the snapshots, you're trying for a maximum temperature. So if you're successful, you know, if you're if you're on target with that, you go at the right time at the right at the right day, on the right day with warm temperatures, you get this maximum estimated maximum temperature and then you can extrapolate based on a relationship like this, you can extrapolate what the average temperature in that stream will be. And that then allows you to consider these types of thresholds with regard to the trout population. So the idea here is being very strategic with your timing and your locations for your sampling and getting a really good estimate of a maximum water temperature for all these different locations within your watershed. And then because you have that relationship to average temperature, you can then infer average temperatures in those streams and get a pretty good idea of um, you know how what conditions your your those those sites are in with regard to these types of trout thresholds. Again, these are the same basic ones that I noted earlier. Um, and here's that conversion where you get your snapshot measurements. You use the equation from that relationship to convert these snapshot measurements to an estimated average temperature, which then gives you an, an idea of how that stream is gonna relate to trout temperature thresholds. Okay, so moving on to, and we are running out of time and I apologize. We've had good discussions though, so that's good. So this was an interesting statement by Dave Manning. Why, why municipal decision makers would care about stream temperature is a driving question and it's a hard one to answer. Our document should provide a list of reasons and examples, which will certainly depend on the municipality. It will be incumbent upon the reader to apply the info accordingly. So this is sort of that question about like educating ourselves enough to be able to educate others and prepare materials that are going to be simple but informative that 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 municipalities can use as references to understand these issues. Steve Tricarico. I suggest that we start off by simply attending municipal meetings and observe at least one or two meetings. Simply be a face in the crowd. Next meeting, ask to be put on the agenda and simply introduce yourself and your organization. Practice your presentation ahead of time and keep it to less than five minutes. Simply highlight what your group has done to date in helping other organizations. This is not the time to tell them how bad their local environment is or how they need to adopt better ordinances or try to educate them on water temperature issues. So gently working into the conversation, 
Um, what this made me think about was, uh, you know, maybe at some point here soon, we start collecting a list of people uh, within our network that are already doing this, going to municipal meetings, or are ready and willing and able to go to meetings, but have not done it yet. And, and maybe we assemble that list and we start working towards providing them with um, a plan for engaging in these meetings. Dave, if I could just interject real quick, we're fortunate with Topol Creek Water Association because one of our members is actually a, a member of the Board of Supervisors in her township, and another member is actually the township manager in one of our townships that are in our, our watershed. So we're fortunate to have that kind of background. And maybe if we do a little poll among ourselves, you can find that there are other members that are active within the communities. Yeah, why don't we why don't we talk about this between now and our next first Thursday meeting, and maybe we can develop a poll that we that we send out um, to at least this not network, if even even beyond, and start working in that direction. I, I have a question for uh, Steve in in terms of uh, going to town boards or town planning boards. Um, what is your thinking? It's usually the, the elected officials, which would be the board of supervisors, are the ones that actually could uh, make decisions and, and enact ordinances, things of that nature. So probably if you had to choose between the two, I think the board of supervisors would probably be the, the place to focus on. Planning commission usually review things and make recommendations, but they're not the people that make the final decisions. I guess my question is directed because my experience has been that the um, we appear, our group appears before uh, the planning board when there are applicants that have outrageous projects and um, land use is absolutely critical, such as the one New Century uh, film down in Huguenot now in, Deer, in the town of Deer Park, um, that they're the decision makers on these big projects. They're within the Neversink uh, watershed. There are seven big projects happening all the way up to the headwaters. So, and the town boards do not interact uh, directly. So that, to, you know, I guess it's different in every area and every state. So any rate, that's my contribution on that end. Yeah, you're correct. It is, it is different in different areas, but at least in the state of Pennsylvania, I would say majority of the townships, it's the supervisors that, are the ones that make the final decision. Uh, ideally, you would attend both the planning commission meetings and the board of supervisor meetings, but you might be 